Well, welcome everyone. Since my channel is about hobbies that I enjoy, I thought we'd geek out on my home theater setup for a little bit. The main point of this video is to demonstrate how you can have a sort of a multi-function room environment that's not quite a dedicated home theater and at the same time get an experience that's similar to what you might find if you were to take the family down to the local Cineplex for the evening, except without all the cost. Six dollar sodas? Come on. We can do better than that, right? So let's take a look at some of this stuff right away. All right, so we'll start out with the room itself first. Kind of take a look at some of the decor, the shape of the room, and how I've integrated uh, the theater into the living room. That's right, this room is normally used just for regular everyday living. That's what makes it multi-purpose. In here, we've got our television set up right down here in the corner. That's my cat, who's currently letting light in the room for my blackout drapes. The blackout drapes are important, obviously, because you want a light-controlled environment. There's my terrible back porch. I've got some grapes back there that I need to trim back for the season. But when I can keep the cat out of here, move. No animals were harmed during the filming of this video. Then the blackout drapes provide pretty good light control, especially for a living room area. Right now I've got some other lights on in the room. I've got the light that I'm using to shoot this video right now. And then over here in the corner, I've got uh, a nice stand light. This is very inexpensive. You can get them down at, you know, Walmart or other retail stores like that. For the uh, paddle fan, the overhead light, I actually included a dimming feature. I just installed a dimmer switch right here on the wall, a little slider. As paddle fans go, you can also find paddle fans with remote dimming. It'll give you a little remote with it and different features like that. You can experiment with that down at the hardware store. Different kinds of paddle fans you can find. This one was just a few dollars cheaper. I didn't mind having the switch on the wall, so that's what I went with. So if you look around, there's no fourth wall in this room. It's quite open on this side. And it's not always the best thing for sound, but the sound system that I use is able to compensate for that at least somewhat. I'll show you a little bit more about that later. For now, as far as the acoustics of the room, well, like I said, it's a living room. I could probably do some fabric panels if I wanted to, to help with the acoustics just a little bit. But one of the things I made sure I did is I got a nice soft throw rug down there. The seating back here is made of a material that's not very sound reflective. I don't know how well you can see that. Let me lighten the picture up a little bit. There you go. Now I'm a little washed out, but the point is, you can kind of see the materials that I use, along with the blackout drapes. These things are a little bit better for acoustics, especially with things like the downward firing center channel up here above the screen. That's actually shooting right down into the middle of the room here. We're not going to get a whole lot of bad reflection off of that. By no means am I a sound expert. Some of you are going to pick up on that when you're watching this video. But I kind of went with what really sounded good for us. And what that ended up being were these THX certified all-in-one box speakers here that you can see. It's hard to point to things when you're shooting a video behind your head, but uh, this is a 7.1 channel setup. They're from Onkyo, and Onkyo says that these bad boys are THX certified. I think what that means when they talk about THX certification is the level to which the speakers are tested. You can see the little THX symbol right here and probably the quality of the design as well. The point is, they're not terribly expensive. They came in an all-in-one box, right along with the uh, AV receiver that I'll show you here in just a little bit. But if you take the uh, covers off, you can see they've got some nice weaved cones. Little tweets there in the middle. These are the fronts. And then up above here, we've got hype channels. And that's how I decided to do the 7.1 for this room. Now you can do a couple of different things. You can either have, when you do a 7.1 setup, your surrounds behind you as always as if it were 5.1. See what the numbers mean is how many channels you have. You have a five channel surround system. That means that you've got a, a left and a right front a center channel, and then four and five are your rear surrounds, right? The seven channel surround system is gonna have either surround channels uh, mounted to either side of the audience, here on the right or left. But as you can see, I don't have the fourth wall in this room. 
okay? So I had to do something different to make that work. And with Dolby Atmos, which is one of the new, or the newer technologies, you can have hype channels, which is a way of taking advantage of those other two channels, where maybe you're not getting the left and right surround, but you're getting, instead, you're getting some really nice, uh, I think sometimes they call them God voice channels or God channels or height channels. You're getting some really neat sounds that not only you hear overhead, which adds an extra dimension, but they're also set up to reflect off the back corners up here. And that kind of gives you a really neat uh, three-dimensional sound environment. I say point one. Uh, it, this is actually a 7.2 system. I'm doing it in 7.1. The point uh, one or two is a reference to how many subchannels you have. I'm not sure if I said that right, but your base channel, right? So what I'll do here is uh, I'll just show you. The way I did that in this room is I added a subwoofer right down here in the corner, firing into the, into the corner, and that sound travels up and into the room here. That's a 16 inch powered sub back there. Adds a lot of bass. Also, kind of makes it feel like this seat's moving back here in the corner, which is what they tell me is the THX position. So the way my room's set up from that seating position to the screen itself, the 10 foot diagonal is uh, theoretically within just a few inches of being the same field of view that you would get right in the middle of a THX certified theater. As a matter of fact, when you go to the theater, what people like to do is get those metal seats, right? That's the best spot. That's where all the sound is focused. That's where you've got just the right view of the screen. It's not too big in your face and you're not too far away from it, right? THX seating position, that's what they tell me. When I say they tell me, that means I read it online somewhere. And of course, if it's on the internet, it must be right. It works for me, so I'm not gonna argue the point. Most of what I do here is not so much technical, is it is, uh, you know, I just like it. You know, when I sit down in my living room, I get an experience that makes me feel like I'm at the local Cineplex. And that's really the point. I've got a family of six, so when I go to the Cineplex, it costs me about $120 every time I do it. I would say for this entire theater system, I've spent maybe three to 4000 That pays off real quick in the long run. All right, so let's take a look at how I did some of this other stuff. Let's talk about the screen installation for a second. All I did here was I ran some 14-2 cable, just for your standard electrical installation, up to this switch and then up to an outlet that I installed right up here towards the ceiling, just above the screen. The purpose of this switch is that sometimes these electric automated screens can receive uh, stray signals I found from the neighborhood. So it was like we had a ghost. I'd come out here sometimes in the morning and you'd find this screen sitting down and you find the screen sitting hanging down. I didn't like that, so I installed the switch right here. And it's just a simple rocker switch. And I can turn the outlet on and off using that. Beyond that, it's remote controlled. So my 10 foot screen hides up there on the wall. And you know what? Believe it or not, when most people come into my living room, they don't realize that there's a home theater here. Even though you've got a bank of speakers up here, <laughs> a a furled screen up near the ceiling and then right back here is the projection booth and I'll show you that in a minute. They don't really notice it and that's kind of what I wanted. I didn't want them to feel like they were walking into a theater when they come into my living room all the time. Usually after about 10 minutes they look around and they start saying, whoa, you got a home theater. I'm like, yeah, you want to see it? Great conversation piece if you ever have company. Anyway, along with this I threw in some lighting just for the mood. Kind of gives you that theater feel a little bit. I'll show you how I did that. Let me get the screen stopped. All right, so for the lighting, it's real simple. I ordered some uh, LED strip lighting online. Not real expensive stuff. I think I paid maybe $15 for that. And to install it up there, 
I bought some of those industrial clear plastic corner protectors that you see in industrial buildings. A couple lengths of that. Then I put it up there using a two-sided pressure tape right on the right on the screen assembly. And then I did the same thing installing the lights inside. I think that actually came with the kit. And just on the outside of that, I put in some. Just on the outside of that, I covered it with some aluminum tape to help hide the reflection a little bit from the normal seating area. The screen itself, just your normal 16 by 9 ratio. That's important if you're a movie watcher. 120 inch, 10 foot diagonal, 1 to 1 gain, electric motorized generic screen off of, I think, Amazon. I bought it about 6 or 7 years ago. I think I paid about $275 for it with shipping. I think you can get them pretty similarly priced now. It's not real fancy. Certainly there's a lot better screens out there and they tell me that you know, it really makes the picture better, but I see a pretty good picture up there right now. All right, so a little more on these lights here. Again, they're a pretty cheap setup. One of the nice things you can do with them is you can change colors. Just got this little remote right here. Nothing too fancy. Just kind of change the mood if you want to just a little bit. I usually keep them on the yellow setting. That looks to me most like the theatrical kind of lighting setup. Let's talk a little bit about installation. Just out here in the multi-purpose room. As you can see, this uh, room was originally wired for surround sound. That's the that's the outlet down there. If you look up above my head, you see the, the little plates up in the ceiling where the speakers were supposed to go. Well, all that was kind of backwards from what I wanted to do because I wanted to have my AVR receiver in this cabinet back here behind me. If I want to run an HDMI cable over that length, we're talking probably 25, 30 feet. Now, some of you probably already know there's signal loss over the length of an HDMI cable, especially when you've got one that's real long like that. So the only thing that I was able to do was reverse the uh, wiring for these speakers so that they all come out in that cabinet back there. And I'll show you that when I show you the cabinet. I used in-wall speaker wire. That's real important. I came in through the top plate up here. I just went up in the attic and I, I drilled into the top plate and I ran the speaker wire right down in behind these speakers. The speaker wire I used is this stuff right here. Picked it up on Amazon. I think I probably paid 30 bucks for that. Uh, I think it's a 500 foot reel right there. That's 16 gauge, which is what I used for the rear surrounds here behind me. I used the 14 gauge stuff for the stuff up front. The longer the run, the lower the gauge you have to use. In other words, the thicker the wire. So I, I guess that has something to do with uh, uh, the resistance over that distance. Again, not an audio expert. I read it online. I did it. That's just kind of how it works with me. As far as the uh, projection booth you see back here, I did this back when I first installed the theater. The way I did it was actually pretty simple. It didn't cost me much at all. You see, that's my pantry back there. So I multi-purpose that as well. The top part of my pantry is the projection booth. That's where I keep all the AV equipment. That's where I keep the projector, obviously. You can see that poking through there. The way I made this is I just found the studs with a stud finder, put a hole through the drywall between them, measured out the size of the window that I needed. I went and got a a stud, just a 2x4 stud, and cut it up to uh, uh, the length that I needed to create the framing in between the studs. And then I went ahead and just purchased these uh, bullnose corner beads here to kind of match what you see elsewhere in the house. Let's come around the corner here into the audio video uh, cabinet, or the projection booth if you will. I'll show you how I did this with my pantry real quick. When you look up in here, you can see that I constructed this shelving right here to help hold the uh, uh, one of the Blu-ray players. And then right above that there is the uh, AVR receiver. It's 7.2 channel digital. 
this here is a cooling fan for the cabinet. What that does is it draws air right in from uh, in front of the projector into the cabinet and then expels it right out underneath this door here. Uh, you see how it's at an angle. It's actually really effective at cooling. And then right back in the corner there, yeah, you probably can't see it. Yeah, yeah, you can see it there. That's uh, that's another uh, little fan that's actually uh, connected via USB right into the uh, Oppo Blu-ray player right here. So when the Blu-ray player is operating, so is that fan, and that draws air into this part of the cabinet, expels it up here. It mixes with the air that comes in from in front of the projector, and then all of that together combined is blown out of the cabinet with this fan. These components right here, pretty good for the budget theater. Uh, when I say budget, I mean, you know, it's still pretty high-end stuff uh, for the average person, but you can get really expensive with these projectors. You can get into the $10,000, $11,000 range. Uh, for what I wanted to spend on it, uh, this little guy right here is uh, just perfect. And uh, one of the reasons I like it so much is because uh, of the technology that it uses. The technology that it uses is one of the two technologies that you'll find in the local theater at the Cineplex. They use uh, primarily uh, DLP cinema technology. I think that stands for uh, digital light processing uh, and the chips are called micro mirror uh, devices or digital micro mirror devices or DMD chips. Those are produced by Texas Instruments, and uh, that's proprietary technology. Whenever you have a DLP chip these days, it's made by TI, and you'll find them in most of the uh, commercial theater uh, projectors. That technology is really pretty expensive because what you've got on these chips is all of these little micro mirrors, and I'm talking in the micron range, you know, like you could see these guys under a you know, an electron microscope. There's millions of these little uh, mirrors, these little hinged mirrors on these chips and they all vibrate uh, to change light angles and they either dump off light or they project light through the projector lens and then uh, out here onto the screen. And because that technology is so expensive, when you're using it at home, you're really only going to be able to afford a single chip and that's pretty consistent up past the, you know, from what I can see, up past the fifteen twenty thousand dollar range for a single projector after that you know once you get into the commercial installations you're looking at a three chip design and what you've got there uh, is uh, each chip is dedicated to uh, the three colors that we use to create images uh, red green and blue if you know anything about that the three chip images are combined through a prism and the uh, the separate color channels are combined there and then projected out onto the screen with the single chip design, the DLP uh, has a color wheel that is timed to uh, uh, sequence the, the three individual red, green, and blue colors onto the screen uh, one after the other, but they do it so fast that it's really hard for your mind to perceive uh, the fact that there's only one color on the screen at any given time. However, when you're looking at a screen with a single chip uh, projector, uh, sometimes you get what's called rainbow artifacting, and it's exactly for that reason. There's only ever one color up there uh, at any one time, and if you happen to see a real high contrast portion of the picture, and you you get uh, to where you, you look across the screen really fast or move your eyes or whatever, sometimes you'll see those channels separate out just because of the frequency. That gives some people headaches, you know, so... The alternative to that for home use, if you want to stick with the technology that you find down at the uh, down at the Cineplex, is Sony's technology, uh, for one, and I think uh, JVC also uh, has a pretty good uh, product as well when it comes to uh, this technology. It's called LCOS technology. It's also a reflective chip. Instead of having micro mirrors, what it does is it basically it passes uh, the way I understand it light through a liquid crystal display onto uh, the reflective chip and then uh, back out through uh, one of three color channels, red, green, and blue. That technology is not quite as expensive for home use, so they're able to give you the three chips and therefore you don't have the color banding on the screen.
I really enjoy that too. I think it makes the uh, colors a little bit richer as well. And the fact that it's um, a reflective technology like DLP uh, and uh, the way it's the way it's implemented into the into the projector without getting too technical gives you some really nice black levels and higher contrast as well. The other technology that's available that a lot of folks like is the LCD technology. Also fairly inexpensive, also available in free chip designs. I don't care for it too much. I'm kind of a purist when it comes to using the uh, cinematic uh, technology. And I'll show you how the picture looks up here on the screen. This projector back here is a Sony, and their uh, version of LCOS uh, chip technology is called SXRD. I don't really remember what that stands for, but I'll show you a picture on the screen here real quick of its bigger brother. That's their uh, 4K digital uh, design for commercial installations. A lot bigger than my projector, but the neat thing is, is my projector uses some of that technology scaled down for home home use. And that's how I know I'm getting a good quality cinematic like picture up here on the screen. And when I show you this here in a minute, you'll see that. You'll see how the the picture's got a real nice film-like uh, natural look to it. I guess with the LCD stuff, uh, sometimes you can get a little bit more separation between pixels or, or black space uh, to where you get kind of like a screen door effect up here. And in a room this big, it's not something I'm really interested in doing. If you sat back, you know, from what I've read probably about this far, you don't really see it. But I like to be able to walk right up to the screen and see the image as it was intended. The other thing is, this projector here is uh, 1080p, okay, that's your normal uh, high def uh, home spec HD, right, uh, Blu-ray, normal Blu-ray resolution. Interesting thing about that is uh, it's not that far off from what most theater installations have been for about the last uh, decade or so, I guess. Uh, most, most cinematic screens were showing 2K, uh, and uh, well, this is 1920 by 1080 uh, pixels size, 1920 across by 1080 vertical uh, pixels on the screen. I guess the 2K stuff in the in the theater was uh, something like 2048 uh, by 1080. So. In the context of this screen right here, it's less than a 10% difference from edge to edge in resolution. The vertical resolution is exactly the same. Again, pretty close, I think, uh, or close enough to the cinematic standard to give you that experience at home. The 4K stuff, that's on the horizon, but for uh, home theater projectors, you know, it's kind of tough to get that just right now with the current available technology for uh, an affordable price. Sony does a good job with it, but I can't afford the stuff. It's in the, you know, five, six, seven, eight thousand dollar range still. As far as the the more budget-minded stuff, they're kind of doing like a, a 4K, uh, where they're kind of simulating 4K, and some of it looks pretty good, really. Um, and they say uh, on some of the technology that you can't really even tell the difference, but. Uh, you know, 2K is good enough for me. It looks really nice up here again. You'll see that in just a second. I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about my choice of projectors and the specific model number here for this uh, Sony SXRD uh, 2K range projector is the uh, HW, I'm sorry, the VPL HW 45ES projector. It puts out a brilliant high contrast, uh, good black level, near 2K uh, well, 1080p uh, picture, and uh, I'm just in love with it. I think it's uh, probably the best value at the moment in the under 4K market for home theater. Interesting about that, uh, even the theaters uh, are actually going to stop using projectors here pretty soon, I guess. I don't know about pretty soon, but eventually. They're just going to have really just a giant TV up front that people watch. They're going to do away with the projectors altogether. But right now, for me to get a 10-foot uh, television, let me see if I can give you an idea of the size here. For 
for me to get a television that size is way out of my price range. I don't know what they cost. I didn't even bother looking. Also, if you're into the home theater stuff like me, I really feel like the projected images is what we want to see if we like going to the movies. Uh, it's got a nice uh, appearance to it. Uh, hard to describe, really. You don't get that that television look. So that's kind of why I'm in love with that for now. You know, we'll see what the future holds as, as time goes on. Getting back to the uh, AV cabinet up here. The receiver is the Ankyo, uh TXNR757 with the uh, Oppo uh, Ultra Blu-ray player. Uh, it's future-proofed in case I do get to upgrade to 4K at some point. This is the UDP203. Uh, puts out an outstanding picture. Uh, it really takes advantage of all of the, uh, the Blu-ray material. I haven't had a chance to try the Ultra Blu-rays on it, but uh, that's because the projector is not capable of it. But it also puts out uh, good 3D pictures, and uh, the sound output is uh, remarkable. Works really well with the uh, Ankyo uh, AVR receiver. All right, well, let's take a look at the actual picture that this thing puts out. Okay, I'm using the movie Avatar. That's uh, pretty standard for uh, picture calibration when you're uh, setting these things up. It's got a lot of good range with color and picture and uh, so forth. So uh, right now I've got just a, a lot of lights on in the room. So I'm going to go start turning some of these lights off one by one until you can see uh, what kind of a picture we're looking at. Let me get the camera fixed up here. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and turn out my light that I've been using for producing the video. Okay, and you can already start to see that picture come through right there. Again, projecting right out of the, the booth behind me, uh, my pantry, right? And uh, we'll go ahead and turn off uh, the overhead lights there. And I'll dim out the fan light. All right, so here's the picture. And uh, doesn't that look nice? And you can walk right up to this. Here we are, right up at the screen. And you can get right up here. Look, you really don't see the individual pixels in the image, even when you're right up on it like this. Here's the viewing angle. A little bit of light coming in from the, behind the blackout curtains. But this is such a good projector. You can see just, just a just a remarkable picture. And one of the things I like, uh, you'll probably notice the motion judder in the picture. Um, that's actually on purpose. This is uh, set up to output uh, 24 frames per second, just like you would see at the local Cineplex. I don't get into the image smoothing or anything like that. I feel like it makes the picture look too much like video. I want the nice natural film look. Okay, I'm going to back up off of this a little bit. Well, all right. Uh, the picture's a little washed out now because I turned on uh, the big bank of overhead lights here. But another thing I wanted to show you before I wrapped up was uh, a lot of these movies are in this uh, widescreen or 240 to 1 aspect ratio where you've got the margins on the top and bottom. The way they deal with that in the Cinemaplex is they'll mask this uh, image on the sides and then have a constant height image between the, the top and the bottom uh, black areas, which gives you the better contrast, right? Uh, and some of the LCD projectors that are available even now on the home market uh, do that constant height deal. And uh, some folks have even got screens that mask out uh, the sides so that the entire image is surrounded by a high contrasting light absorbing uh, black border. Well, I don't really have that luxury. The screens that do that are really very expensive, uh, I've found, and even to design one, 
uh, that's reliable and effective would be a pretty big undertaking. Also, the, the Sony projector up here doesn't have the constant height motorized lens shifting. You know, that stuff comes at a cost. The budget way to do that is to simply have a screen like this that's motorized. What I do is I just bring the screen down so that the uh, top black margin rests right on top of the image. And you can see right there already how much of a difference that makes in uh, the contrast on the image. You still have the margin at the bottom, but what I've found is, is uh, for that sort of an economical solution, while it isn't perfect, um, when you're watching this, you don't really notice the bottom of the image that much. That actually works out pretty good as a, a nice uh, budget solution. And when the lights are off in here, this is a high enough uh, contrast projector unit with a good enough black level that uh, it kind of it kind of hides that anyway. I'll, I'll demonstrate that real quick by turning these lights off here. There, now you can see, uh, even with the open area at the bottom on the screen, it really does look pretty good like that. I'll walk right up to it here, uh, and you can see how it's masked up top and on the sides. The only thing we have is this area down here. Just a nice uh, budget solution to that problem. All right, well, I'm not going to turn on the sound because it doesn't really come through in the camera anyway. Uh, suffice to say that the Onkyo uh, AVR receiver coupled with the THX certified speakers and the uh, Oppo uh, UDP203 Blu-ray player, uh, that combination puts out a real nice enveloping uh, surround sound field, even in a room like this without the fourth wall. And that's one of the nice things about the Onkyo unit is they come with a room calibrating feature where I have a setup mic that will actually listen uh, to each of the speakers and calibrate them for the room dimensions. It's not perfect, but again, it's a it's kind of a budget-minded solution. And when I sit in here and watch this movie up here, or any movie for that matter, and I hear it for myself, I feel like I'm right down there at the Cineplex, which is the point. Anyway, thanks for joining me in my home today. I had a lot of fun bringing you this video, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching.